20 million people in the US claim to have seen a UFO and 4 million claim to have been abducted. There is something serious going on. Anybody who's seen or experienced these things will tell you they are real. But how do you investigate something that appears and disappears? Despite the claims of there being crashed craft, there are none. But they do leave marks, that lights can go off, strange magnetic forces appear, and they're looking at the evidence and they're coming to a conclusion it's coming from another realm or dimension. But here's the real kicker, Scott. There's cases where these abductions have been halted by people calling on the name of Jesus Christ. As Christians, this is one area where we can explain the answer. What is the answer? Gary, today, the UFO and alien issue looms larger than ever, with world governments openly and officially investigating this issue. Now, I'm really excited to be here with you today because you've got over 25 years experience in researching this matter. You're a best-selling author on the matter, and you have an award-winning movie on aliens and UFOs. So thanks for being with me here today. And what I want to ask you, first of all, is um, what are people seeing and is the government actually recording um, this data and are they covering things up? Well, thank you. Uh, first off, let me say that uh, there's been a change. Uh, the government has officially coined a term called UAPs. So they don't call them UFOs anymore, which meant unidentified flying objects. It's unidentified anomalous phenomena to explain what they're seeing. And I think the reason they've done that is, you know, the history of UFOs, which is a serious topic, but it has some kind of cheesy, flaky, uh, you know, historical aspects to it where people in the past. So I think they're trying to uh, view it as a, a more legitimate area that needs to be investigated. And indeed, the US government um, has not been candid about what they're seeing. Everybody who studies this, like myself, knows that they and lots of people are seeing things. And I think to credit them in some way, they've not known what they're dealing with, which is why they've not been candid. But uh, there's been a bit of a quantum shift in the last few years uh, under the Obama administration. Harry Reid, former uh, leader, uh, Senate Majority Leader, He's turned around and said we were continuing to fund research into UFOs. So that was a, a bit of a surprise to a lot of people, uh, but not to people like me who research it. In fact, the US government has been researching UFOs for over 70 years. Wow. Right back in the 1940s, they started with two projects, Sign and Grudge, and then Project Blue Book, which was made into a History Channel series. There was the Condon Report, and of course there was the famous Roswell incident, and an independent group called the Government uh, Accounting Office investigated uh, that as well. So yes, they are seeing something. Ordinary people see things. Uh, lots of them have contact me even about their experiences and the things that they see. But the fact that the government is now admitting that they are seeing something and they're openly investigating it, uh, in the 20-something years I've been researching this, that, that's a big change. Yeah, one of the amazing things that I saw when watching your movie, Alien Intrusion, was that this has actually been a phenomenon that is very widespread. And I remember hearing a fact on the movie, and I think it was, you can correct me here, it was, I think it was a, a Harvard psychiatrist saying that the statistics were, or he was referring to a poll, I think, that 20 million people in the US have seen a UFO, claimed to have seen a UFO, and 4 million claimed to have been abducted. Yeah, well, that was actually based on something called a Roper poll in 1998. And of course, they take a sample size and then extrapolate that to a larger group. Yes. But I actually think those figures are probably correct because, uh, and probably even more, because wherever I go and speak on it, which has been hundreds of times, uh, almost without fail, Scott, somebody comes up to me and tells me that they've seen things. And I've literally met hundreds and hundreds of people that have seen things. Mm. They're looking for closure. They don't know what they saw. The simple fact is that over 90% of UA, uh, UAP or UFO sightings can be explained by natural phenomena or man-made phenomena. Okay. People are looking up, lay people, they don't know what they're seeing. Um, it's things like the planet Venus, incredibly, accounts for 
you know, about over 30% of all UFO sightings. How can that be? It's because it appears early in the night sky. It doesn't twinkle like a star. It looks like a, a glowing ball. And what causes people to interpret things that way are they're kind of their worldviews and what I call pop culture. UFOs are interpreted like many things in our world based on our belief systems. If you believe that there was a big bang 14 billion years ago and that our Earth is in a relatively young part of the universe, there are alien races that could be millions or billions of years older than us on the evolutionary scale. And could you imagine the advances in technology they've developed in that time? And that's how come they can fly millions of light years across the, the galaxy or the universe rather and stealthily abduct people from their beds in the middle of the night. Now, the other option, of course, is which we can talk about later is, you know, well, there's evolution or there's creation. So that then begs the question, did God create aliens, but you know we can do that one probably later on. Yeah, and I think something very interesting. I think I got this from your movie as well. Is that um, two hundred years ago, if a farmer, I think you mentioned an example like this, if a farmer in his field saw a flash in the sky, he probably wouldn't be able to say it's a UFO, would he? He wouldn't know what it means. Yeah. He probably doesn't even realise there are distant star systems, so he interprets it within his cultural understanding of the day. You know, maybe I need to go and get my eyes checked, or maybe it's a spiritual phenomenon, demon or whatever, depending what religion uh, they believe in. Yeah, but, um, you know, getting back to the government there, they, uh, as I said, uh, they've been investigating, and, and very recently uh, there was a congressional hearing about this. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about this. So this was as recent as July 2023, mm. um, and there were really some spectacular claims. Um, it looks like the government is actually admitting, they're actually admitting now something is going on, which you mentioned. So why are they admitting that now? And so this is 2023, it's a new age, the government is admitting something's going on. Why are they admitting it now and were they covering it up earlier? Well, in, uh, in uh, my movie, Alien Intrusion, I'm Masking a Deception, we showed some footage from a 2010 uh, meeting uh, conference at the Washington Press Club and over 80 Air Force officers, these are just not enlisted guys, so these are guys with you know, responsible positions in the military, got up and gave testimony about seeing UFOs flying at speeds that our conventional craft can't do. They merge into one another, they do right angle turns or accelerate towards the ground and come back up without slowing down. So these are literally defying the laws of physics. And then more shockingly, they said that they've entered uh, nuclear missile silos and have affected the operational readiness of nuclear weapons. So that was very startling. So I, to be honest, I've never mentioned and spoken about that because it's almost like a bridge too far to mention. It's too hard to believe. But Harry Reid, who I mentioned before, you can watch on YouTube. In fact, go to creation.com in one of our articles there, type in his name, you can see an interview where he actually says that these UAPs have affected uh, the operational readiness of America's nuclear arsenal to such an extent that if the president had ordered a first strike or even a defensive strike, he wouldn't have been able to. So when you've got people in your military who are witnessing all of this stuff, it's ultimately going to be a bit hard to keep the lid on it forever. Do you, do you think that's true, that goes? So Harry Reid, who, who, who was he again? And Former Senate Majority Leader in the House. So. Yeah. Second after, after the president, vice president, he's the next guy in line. Uh, yeah, so he's a UFO enthusiast, though. He's a UFO believer. Okay. And you'll see elsewhere. But yes, I, you know, there are too many testimonies from military personnel. Uh, and that's a serious thing, as you can imagine. Yeah. But here's the thing. What are they dealing with? And they still don't know. Yeah, and, and you said he's a believer there. And we were chatting earlier before we started this, and you were saying that actually people are influenced by their prior beliefs. In fact, you've already mentioned it mm. already. It's the worldview of the day. You in, So could have that had an influence as well? I, I think so. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, polls have shown, and, and even my own informal polls, I think if you go and ask any high school or in a public high school or in Australia or America or the UK or anywhere, do aliens exist, you'll get... Of course they do. Yeah, It's not a maybe. Yeah. Uh, and again, what underpins that is the fact that we live in such a massive universe and people think if evolution's true, it must have evolved somewhere else. Yeah, if, if we're just here by accident and the universe is huge, mm -hmm. then there must have been other accidents happening elsewhere. Absolutely, because look at the time frames. We're yeah. talking 
billions of years. Yes, you know, yes. Not thousands or hundreds and millions. Billions of years is the age of the universe. Yeah, and as we were saying, the, so that we're told that the Earth is only 4.5 billion years old, so the solar system is about that old, but hmm. possibly there's other star systems that evolved earlier, and therefore they might be more advanced. Yeah. Wow. So exactly. So this. So it's interesting that this is driven by an evolutionary worldview, and would that match the timing as well, Gary? You know how. So the theory of evolution came about Charles Darwin, 1859, the Origin of Species. Um, how soon after that did we start getting the thought about aliens, or was aliens? Was that possible before? No, not no. really. No. I think uh, it's it's a modern phenomenon. The phenomenon itself is not new. It's the interpretation of the phenomenon that's new. Uh, right. We can talk about it later, but uh, yeah. in the movie we showed in ancient history, wherever we've got ri written records, the ancient Greeks, Alexander said he saw flying shields attacking his army. Wow. Uh, American Indians have stories of flying canoes with occupants on board, for example. So we have records of these anomalous sightings throughout history, but again, are they interpreting something that is shiny and metallic as a flying canoe, or are they literally seeing a flying canoe? We don't know because we're not there. My personal view is it manifests towards the cultural understanding of the day. And I'm not alone in that. Uh, even non-Christian researchers like Nick Redfern will say that it masquerades towards the understanding of the people that it's appearing to. Interesting. So some of, some of this might be due to the popular idea of aliens and that even being possible. So the evolutionary worldview coming into existence 200-ish years ago, has influenced how this phenomenon manifests. Yep, definitely. It's, yeah. it's changed over time. There's no question. It's changed in the last 100 yeah. years. It's only since about the 1940s, which corresponds with the jet age, that we start to see the idea of flying disks or, and you know, the most popular shape in the 70s was the triangle shape. And, you know, I have no idea why, to be frank. And so when you, people spotting a UFO, they'd usually see a triangle. That's That was very, very common, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I guess there's also since the roughly the 60s, I know at least in America and, the, and Australia, there's evolution's been taught in all schools since about that age. So you, yeah. you've got that um, yeah. worldview being set in people's minds. So they're interpreting this phenomenon. But way. let me just say something here. Yeah. So in my experience, most Christians also don't have a problem with the idea that God created aliens and they're possibly visiting us as well. So it's the door is definitely open on that one, and that's something we need to talk about. Yeah, I really I do want to touch on that because I've experienced the same. There's a lot of Christians that say, okay, God could have created things. So mm. instead of evolving in different places, God could have created aliens on other planets. So we're going to hit that one and talk about what the Bible says on that. I'd like mm. you to explain that to us. So we've talked about the July 2023 congressional hearings. Um, but what about, there's something even more recent than that. September 2023, we had the little aliens in the Mexican government. Uh, <laughs> what's that all about? Yeah, and look, uh, there, there's a term in ufology, uh, which is kind of the study of UFOs. I suppose I qualify as a ufologist. But, um, uh, and it's called debunker. So when something comes up, you're always to too eager to put it down. So let me just say, I've already said, there is something going on that we need to quantify. Yep. But in this case, this is one of those that is media hype. And unfortunately, the gentleman who brought forward these two supposedly alien bodies, uh, and look, to be honest, they look fake, and I think it's because they are. Um, you've got to dive between dive underneath and deeper in the press reports. So you see things like alien bodies. Now, the gentleman that produced these, his name is Jamie Mousen. I mentioned him in my book. Uh, he's a well-known Mexican ufologist. Uh, he's been criticized and found out hoaxing and faking stuff before, uh, etc. There was a, a Peruvian uh, mummy that was allegedly alien uh, in the past. Um, and what they say are things like, we are getting scientific research done on this. Yes. But they're not telling you the results of that. So when you hear, oh, they're getting scientific research, the initial inclination is to think, oh, the scientific research is supporting the claim. But you can go on there and you can see that the scientists and the body that he sent it to have dis distanced themselves from his claims, mm. right? 
and the best we can find out, because it takes a while and they'll officially publish a report and probably a journal article somewhere that it's an assemblage of llama bones and there are some human bones in there and all sorts of stuff like that. And this reminds me of another episode uh, which I wrote about another famous ufologist called Stephen Greer. Uh, his former medical doctor, he had, had a movie called Sirius. I've written a review on creation.com about that. But it was one called The Atacama Alien, and there were pictures of it. And it, it looks humanoid, but it's got a very weird-shaped head, etc. cetera. Um, and it's de de definitely a mummified organism. So in the movie, he said, we are getting DNA testing done on this. Wow, they're getting DNA testing. It must be real. But then later, the organization that was doing the DNA testing came out and they said, it's human. It was a deformed you know, uh, fetus. It was the case of dwarfism. And in the very, very dry desert in Peru, it had desiccated the body. But yes. because of its uh, you know, um, abnormalities, it had a weird shaped head and so on. And that, and that kind of reminds me, just, just on that, you know, we mentioned the congressional hearings. Yep. There was a former military intelligence officer, Air Force officer named David Grush, and I've been sent a lot of emails about this. Uh, I watched it. He was asked by uh, one of the politicians, he said, and the question was, have you recovered alien bodies? And again, I'm going to be fairly critical here because his answer really told me everything that I needed to know. He didn't answer yes or no. He said, we have recovered non-human biological material. I mean, what does that mean, <laughs> yeah. right? I yeah. mean, it could have been a bug on the windscreen. I mean, it's anything that is non-human non yeah. could be biological material. So why do I say this? You know, people are complex beings. We either put them into categories, you know, they're, they're mad or they're bad. But we talked about our worldviews and our beliefs shaping apart. And I've experienced that there are very, very sincere people who believe that aliens are visiting us and the government's covering it up. And sometimes the end justifies the means. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, I want you to believe, Scott, what I believe. So if I'm not quite candid with the truth and it causes you to investigate more, maybe I can get you, you know, on board with us, etc. So mm. when somebody gives a bit of an evasive answer like that, it tells me, ah, okay, he's, mm. he's not playing with a straight bat, as we'd say in Australia. Interesting. But you said you're not a debunker. And so you recognize these experiences that these people have had. So I think what you're saying, Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're saying, okay, I acknowledge that some of these people, even the people that are fraudsters, for want of a better mm. word, that are putting forward things as real alien bodies, but they're not, would you say that they're maybe they're probably an experiencer, someone that's ex had an experience, because as we said, 4 million people, and that's just in the US, mm. have experienced alien abductions. Um, they're an experiencer, and they want other people to know that this is a real thing, because to them it was very real. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's that can be part of it. It might not, they might not be experiencers themselves, but they've met lots of people who've had experiences. They have similar stories. Then you think, well, they can't be watching all the same science fiction movies. Yes. So there has to be something going on. And that is the experience of genuine researchers. And yeah. indeed, it's my experience. When yes. I'm meeting people, you can find a pattern, uh, particularly at the levels of abductions which is where I think, you know, later on we can talk about that, but, but I think that's where we're going to really unpick, unpick or unpack what's going on. Yeah, and that pattern was what was very interesting to me. I mentioned in your movie, Alien Intrusion, how I'd heard that figure that, and, and we talked about it earlier, so 90%, uh, well, well, first of all, 20 million people in the mm. US seen uh, UFOs, and you said 90% of them can be explained by physical phenomenon, yeah. but there's 10% that can't. Yeah, but the 10% that can't, doesn't necessarily mean that it's alien technology or something supernatural. It just means we don't have enough information at the okay. time yep. to identify it. So let me tell you what actually real UFO researchers do. And I, I know them. <laughs> They're friends of mine. They work for MUFON in the United States. They go out. Somebody, they write it down. Somebody says, this is what I saw. What time of the day or night? What was the environmental conditions like? Then they'll say, was the Air Force or anybody conducting drills? Was the moon out? They, they'll investigate all of these things. And so sometimes we don't have access to all of that information. 
So it might be explained as man-made or even natural phenomena. We mentioned the planet Venus. There's yeah. things like lenticular clouds, flocks of birds that people see, uh, etc. You're telling me the space station, you've seen the space station go across the sky and yeah, that looks like a light. Yeah, it's a light and yeah. it, it looks like it's traveling. It's in a, a straight line. And if yeah. you don't know what you're looking at, sure. and because of evolution and science fiction, people look up and go, oh, I just saw a UFO. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. Yes. Where we can unpick it, though, is there is a small percentage that there is unquestionable evidence of them doing what I would describe as supernatural things. That is, they appear, they disappear, they change shape. You know, when I say something accelerates or, change, or it does a right angle turn without slowing down, I mean, you would be splattered up against the walls of your craft if you're trying to do those things. And mm. It takes science fiction to overcome that, you know. If you watch Star Trek and Jean-Luc Picard, you know, uh, says, uh, make it so, and they accelerate into warp factor five, they've got these things called inertial dampeners to stop you getting splattered up against the wall and that yeah. type of stuff. But that really is in the realm of science fiction, and it's not a matter of having advanced technology. It, 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 you know, this annoys people. They say, well, you can't say this because we don't know what they'll develop in the future. But we're basing it on what we do know, right? Not what we don't know. Advanced technology, uh, is it really going to make you appear and disappear in from one dimension to another? I, I don't think so. Yeah, and the and some of those things we'll, I want to get to talk on later about the sharp right angle turns, the incredible G force that you'd experience. Um, that, like, is is tech, is it realistic that technology in the future will overcome some of these issues? Um, and after all of these years of investigation, uh, it appears like the government doesn't have a, an answer. They're not saying this is UFOs. They're not saying this is UAPs now. Right. But what, what, they're not saying what it is. It's just a UAP, unidentified aerial phenomenon. Was that right? Unidentified anomalous, anomalous phenom phenomenon. Anomalous phenomenon. Okay, there we yeah. go. I still think nothing has changed, even though they're being more candid now than they were in the past. Yeah. They still don't know what they're looking at because at the end of the day, you are going to have to collect a, a crashed craft. You're going to have to have alien bodies to try to determine something. And, you know, we can't lasso or get my tractor beam in to haul in one of these UAPs or whatever. And despite the claims of there being crashed craft, there are none, okay? It's as simple as that. But they do leave marks. They've been known to affect our environment, okay? Just like the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, lights can go off. Uh, strange magnetic forces appear, so they certainly can affect our environment and our and our realm. And that's okay. why I say there is something serious going on. And um, you know, anybody who's seen or experienced these things will tell you that they are real. But how do you investigate something that appears and disappears? Mm. And that's the problem the government's going to going to face. But I suspect we're facing a time, Scott, because. I believe, and we'll probably talk about what I've described as the more supernatural aspects of them, mm. but most of the world doesn't recognize the supernatural realm. Of course, we live in a naturalistic world. All of our science, yes. all of the top universities, we're based off naturalism. So we only investigate the natural world. Yeah. And, and really, that's what I was uh, until I had an experience. Mine was an experience of God, not an experience of an alien, an experience at the age of 18. I just believed in the natural world as well. So I, yeah. I know like the way we work is on the natural world. So how are you going to get a conclusion about some of these things that seem to defy laws of science, mm -hmm. laws of logic? And how are, you, how are you going to do that from a naturalistic mindset? And yeah. I guess is that, that's the problem, right? Yeah. Well, the, when we first started investigating this, there was something called the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Mm. And that's the view that real aliens are traveling in real physical spacecraft, you know, from a galaxy far, far away. To be honest, after all the years of research, most people don't believe that. There's only a few diehards. Mm. The alternative is something called the interdimensional hypothesis. Can you just tell us first, I really want to hear yeah. that interdi interdimensional hypothesis. W why is that hypothesis, the previous one, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, why is that one be being put aside now? Yeah, and that's because of what I said earlier, because of what we do know. Um, if I'm just going to quote some stats for you. All yeah, right? go on, So go ju through. just off here. And I had a whole chapter in my book uh, about this, whether these science fiction ideas uh, 
can happen. So I want you to imagine the space shuttle and the Saturn V rockets that took man to the moon. Now, prior to the new Falcon Heavy rockets that Musk's developing, these are the most powerful vehicles mankind had ever produced. Just the main engines on the space shuttle can produce about 3.3 million kilograms of thrust. Mm. Wow. Now, at the best speed we could muster, it would it would take you 800,000 years to reach the next star to our own sun, Proxima Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away. It takes you 800,000 years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so think about this, that's within our own galaxy. Mm. So when you leave our galaxy, even if you could travel at the better. speed of light, right, 300,000 kilometers per second, it would take you two million years to reach the next galaxy to our own Milky Way, Andromeda. that's Andromeda. And the next galaxy after that is 20 million light years away, right, if you could travel at the speed of light. So even if you could travel double at the speed of light or 10 times the speed of light, the distances are phenomenal. And, yeah. and, and the, here's the problem, you know, space is not empty. Yeah. There's lots of cosmic dust. So even, even a grain of dust, if you were traveling at one-tenth of the speed of light, that would be like 10 tons of TNT impacting on the hull of your spaceship. Gosh. So we see in Star Trek, they have these deflector arrays or force fields to repel that. But you've got to use the same amount of equally opposing force that you're traveling with to deflect that object. So that's only adding to the impossible energy requirements, you know, for your ship. And and so a lot of people would say, you know, anywhere near the speed of light is impossible for any, you know, it's, it's these particles that have zero weight, like photons or things like this that are able to travel at or near the speed of light. Because as you know, your mass increases as you go near the speed of light, it's an effect of relativity. So. So what you're talking about is two, uh, was it two, two and a half million light years, I think it is, to the nearest galaxy? Two million light years to the next galaxy, yeah, Andromeda. Yeah. So, so even if we were to travel at a tenth of the speed of light, it's 20 million years. Mm -hmm. so, so the point here is that I think you're making is that if there was extraterrestrial life out there, it couldn't visit us. It doesn't have the time to visit us. Not, not in spacecraft. Yeah. And that's, you know, where we're going to talk about the interdimensional right. hypothesis. G-forces is another one you oh, mentioned. Oh, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, yeah, go on. Because acceleration is, you know, when, as I say, on Star Trek, when he says, make it so, and they jump into warp factor six. Mm. I mean, could you imagine the acceleration forces? Just You'd be, be splattered. Yeah. yeah, be splattered. And that's why they invent these things called inertial dampeners to avoid you. But again, it's the stuff of science fiction. Now, it's fun. Yeah. I love science fiction. Uh, and some science fiction has become possible. Arthur C. Clarke developed, the, you know, invented the idea of satellites above the Earth to, yeah. you know, carry radio waves to, uh, you know, get over the line of sight problem due to the curvature of the Earth. So some of it can be, but not this type of stuff. You know, and I, again, we've talked about impacts, uh, etc., and radiation, because radiation, even if we're looking at manned uh, missions to Mars, we're talking several years in duration, mm. the effect of weightlessness, the effect of cosmic radiation on the body, uh, etc. Yeah, so and you mentioned about the speed of light as your mass increases. Speed increases. Your speed increases, sorry, your mass increases. And Einstein theorized, and there's good experimental evidence to suggest this from what we do know, that as you approach the speed of light, your mass becomes infinite. Mm -hmm. So you've got to use an infinite amount of energy to try to get to the speed of light. What does all that mean? Yeah. Basically, it's impossible. Yeah, they, these are not technological barriers. These are laws of physics barriers, exactly. laws of nature's barriers. So your point here is that the extraterrestrial hypothesis, whilst it was good for a while if we imagined we could overcome some technological barriers. Now we've become more sure about maybe the laws of nature. We can we understand it's impossible. Even if you had um, technology which we've never even dreamed about, the laws of nature prevent alien species from um, other galaxies visiting us. Exactly. So remember, we talked about 100 years ago. In the last 100 years, that's when most of the understanding about the enormous size of our universe has become apparent. True. So the extraterrestrial hypothesis was probably more prevalent when we didn't realize how far these distant star systems are. Now that we know how far they are, yes, it's impossible. And this is just not, and uh, you know, a Christian saying, "Well, you yeah. know, he's a debunker." 
uh, basically scientists and physicists would agree with this, that if we are being visited, yep. we're clearly not being visited by aliens that are living millions of light years away. And I was just thinking as you are saying that, the last hundred years is, as we've gained our knowledge about relativity, it was the early uh, 20th century that Einstein came up with special and then general relativity, 1905, 1915. Yeah. So it's, that's in very interesting that that matches. So what we're coming to is now, it's not an extraterrestrial hypothesis. That's not you as a Christian Gary saying, it's not extraterrestrials. That is the scientific explanation. That's the government explanation they're coming up. And now it's the interdimensional hypothesis. Yeah, well, you, we talked about if they don't believe in the supernatural, and, and and naturalism is really, you know, uh, yeah. their, their worldview, how are they interpreting it? They're going to say, well, it must be coming to us. It can't be supernatural. It's got to be coming to us from another realm or dimension, hence the interdimensional hypothesis. And again, the reason I'm saying that is because it's actually what the evidence demands. When you see something just appear and disappear, uh, and I say they sometimes these craft merge into each other, at incredible speeds and become one object and then go off in another direction. And when we say we're seeing these, these are just not eyewitnesses. They've been tracked on radar doing wow. these things. This is what I mean by military pilots and Air Force officers. And then, of course, we'll talk about people that are having experiences, what we call abductions. Well, how are the aliens suddenly appearing in the room and disappearing, alleged aliens, etc.? So the interdimensional hypothesis even in the years I've been researching, this has been a change from the ETH mm. to the IDH, the Interdimensional Hypothesis. Okay, That's sure. now really the most popular views. And what plays into that from what I would call a pseudoscientific aspect is the ideas of multiverse and string theory, mm. and there might be different levels to our existence or different levels in the universe. An unprovable, so what's happening now, they're resorting to unknowns to explain unknowns. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. So we've said these things, and I just want to establish it with you that, it, like, or just confirm again that you're saying we have actually seen this happening on radar. The US military have seen this on radar, have seen um, things that can only be explained by something that's supernatural in nature, that, things that defy naturalistic explanation. They've seen it on actual yeah. radar. They've released footage. That was the shocking thing. When they've always had plausible deniability in the last couple of years, they've released footage of Navy pilots trying to chase these things and they can't keep up with them. And you can. they've even released the audio and the pilots just going crazy, yeah. trying to explain what he's seeing and what's happening. And then recently one actually flew into the water besides a Navy ship and just disappeared, you know, flew in at incredible speed. So again there, how can you fly a craft and impact into the ocean at some incredible speed without, you know, smashing your craft to bits? So you can understand from their naturalistic worldview, this is very, very puzzling. Yep. But I honestly believe, Scott, as Christians, I really do think this is one area where we have an advantage and can explain the answer because the Bible's always talked about there being another realm or dimension. And they're looking at the evidence of what they call UA UAPs and they're coming to a conclusion it's coming from another realm or dimension. Yeah, and, and you, as you said, they're using the... They're, they're using unknowns to explain unknowns. They have yeah, unknowns because, and they're resorting to further unknowns to explain yeah. what is unknown, yeah. Because some of these physics theories like the um, multiverse and things like this, they're really, there's not, um, we don't have physical evidence to back these theories up. Not they're, a shred. They're often used to explain phenomena that um, don't have naturalistic explanations. Exactly. So it's a funny loop yeah. that loops back. Yeah. Um, so, so Gary, we're saying that the UFO phenomenon, although 90% can be explained physically, um, there's this remaining 10% and some of them we just don't know, but there are definitely some in that 10% that have no naturalistic explanation. Yeah. Now I want to move on to alien abductions now. Now we said, in the going back to that poll again, 20 million in the US um, seen UFOs, 4 million for the alien abductions just yeah. in the US alone. What's happening to people when they when they experience an alien abduction, because I, I just want to preface it with this. In your movie, you have a clip of a, uh, and I think I mentioned him earlier, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I think he's the head of the Harvard Medical School, yeah. is that right? Yeah, Trained psychiatrist. And he is appears on his Oprah Winfrey show. 
uh, on Oprah, and he was also interviewed by another psychiatrist uh, based on his research, asking him what, he, what his discoveries were. But the thing that impacted me in your movie was when he said, when people are having the alien abduction experience, he said the people he interviewed, they were sane people. They, weren't, they didn't have any um, mental problems. Um, and the thing that he found very surprising was they were having very similar experiences. Yeah. And so he said, what? And I saw him on the show saying, well, what is this phenomenon? How do we explain? Like, it's a real phenomenon, is what he was yeah. saying. It's a real psychological phenomenon. How do I explain it? Yeah. A couple of things. So we've kind of said the US government and polls in America. Let me just say, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. So yeah. all the governments Good know point. about it. Um, but it's the US government at the moment that's actually kind of let the cat out of the bag and have opened a Pandora's box, I believe. Um, but you're talking about uh, Dr. John Mack, uh, right. deceased now. So... He was not a believer. He's a psychiatrist, and he'd heard this story about people claiming alleged alien abductions. And there was a UFO researcher called Bud Hopkins, he appears in our movie, who was interviewing these what alleged abductees. He was hypnotizing them, so he was regressing their memories, supposedly, mm -hmm. trying to account for what was happening during this missing time between, you know, when they saw an alien standing in their room and they wake up hours later and they can't remember. So he thought, oh, this is an interesting psychological phenomenon to study. But then when he followed Bud Hopkins around, he did. He found they all had very similar experiences. Uh, we have footage of him on the Oprah Winfrey show. He says, it's not fantasy, it's not lies. These people are suffering genuine post-traumatic stress symptoms. And the only thing that expresses itself like that from a medical point of view is real experience. Wow. So he ended up becoming a believer in it and one of the world's leading researchers in this, in this and he wrote a book about uh, abductions. And so in one of the interviews, he's being interviewed by a fellow uh, psychiatrist, and this blew me away because, to the best of my knowledge, he's not a Christian. He's researching this from, again, from his naturalistic worldview, but he basically makes the claim in this interview that we are dealing with spirit beings, I'm paraphrasing, mm. coming to us from another realm or dimension. Yeah. Why? Based upon the actual evidence of what is happening to these people. Yeah. And this is right in the wheelhouse of Christianity, Scott. Yeah, and I would like to uh, explain why, why that is. Well, as I said, the Bible's always talked about another dimension. And we've had visitors from that dimension and they're called angels, good ones, bad ones. And the cultural view of angels is these ethereal spirit beings with fairy wings and whatever. But show me in the Bible where they ever appear like that. Mm. They appear physically. You know, three sit down with Abraham and eat food. Does that mean they have physical bodies and stomach organs and digestive tracts? But here's the other thing, they affect our environment. Think about God's destroying angel in Egypt, bringing plagues against nature, for example. Uh, recently, CMI, Creation Ministries, we conducted a tour of Israel, and we saw some of the archaeological evidence there of the Assyrians. And the story says that when they tried to get attack Jerusalem, one of God's angels killed 187,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night, wow. right? So very, very powerful beings what we see in the UFO phenomenon is very, very powerful phenomena affecting our realm. But when I said there's good and bad angels, well, God's angels always bring a message that is consistent with what we'd read in God's word. Yes. But the bad guys, what's their job? They're there to deceive and deflect and to take people's eyes away from the creator. And one of the key points when it comes to abductees or alleged abductees, in fact, we don't like to call them that because, yeah. to be frank, they're not being abducted by aliens. They're experiencing something, so we call them experiences. But they're told stories. And John Mack, a non-Christian researcher, found this out. And he says, after their experiences, and some of them are ongoing and multiple, yes. they become evangelists for their aliens' cause. They're told, told stories like the aliens are the creators, or we've been overseeing human evolution for millions of years, and, and I've chosen you, and you're special, and I've got a job for you. Now, we just need to think about that for a moment. If you've, you don't know Jesus, you've never read the Bible, you've never been in a church, a little gray entity stands at the bottom of your bed in the middle of the night and says, you're special. 
and you've not heard that before because you've not been in church, so you've not heard God says you're special. So that's that's a life changing experience for it somebody. It would be, Scott. yeah. Because I remember I, I, every Christian will say when God says they're special, that's an incredible life changing experience. But yeah. if you've not had that from your real Creator God, and so it, it, that's why their lives are changed. Wow. And here's the thing: it's not you had that experience last night. It's not exactly something you can go to the office tomorrow and talk around the water cooler about, you know, let me tell you what happened to me last night. I was abducted. I was taken off to Zeta Reticuli, et cetera. So what happens is the, the isolating experience drives them in deeper. Mm. And then if they have another experience, a similar encounter, again, it's the people that are doing the abusing to them, and we haven't spoken much about that, mm. that become their allies. Well, you're the only one that can understand because you're the one that's doing it to me and I can't tell anybody else. And Mac and others found out that generally these experiences are actually harmful. That's why mm -hmm. he mentioned post-traumatic stress, stress syndrome, etc. Yeah. So they're abused, they're sometimes sexually abused and mm -hmm. assaulted. Uh, it's very, very sordid what happens to these people. And un mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, but realistically, mm -hmm. um, you know, unlike many of my colleagues in the ministry, because I spe specialize in this, I've had these people come to me and tell me all of these details, all of these things that have happened to them. And just like Mac, you can find a pattern of these things that is, is going on with people. But as I say, the yeah. harmful, the experience is uniformly mm -hmm. harmful, deleterious. Some people were watching and they say, well, it wasn't for me. You know, maybe I had it and it was good. But I guarantee, give me 10 minutes with them and I can point out where it would be harmful to them. These experiences, they, the people that are ex having these experiences, they often say that it's good and they're having something good happen to them. And the aliens, as you mentioned, the, they're maybe more advanced and they're the ones that are overseeing human evolution and they're almost like the gods. And uh, it seems, would you say it's kind of it also fills a spiritual void as we're becoming less spiritual in the Western world? As in fact, it, yeah, you don't have to take my word for it. Ufologists have said that ufology has become a substitute religion. Because mm. guess what? When we we talk about our worldviews, the key question to our worldviews ultimately is, where did I come from? Yes. Am I evolved? Am I a cosmic accident? Or did God create me? And and based upon that. First question, you'll determine your meaning and purpose in life and also what happens to us when we die. But the alien phenomenon can answer that question too because if aliens are your creators, mm. they're telling you what your meaning and purpose is and they actually have their own eschatology too. Wow. You know, I mean, that's a whole, we could do another whole talk on that because they're going to take people off to some utopian planet and we're all going to live in peace and harmony. And even abductees, as bizarre as this sounds, They'll say they've been up on the spaceship and they've met Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and they're all living together in peace and harmony. There's this unifying mm. kind of message, which sounds really, really good on the surface. Attractive. Yeah, because it's this message of peace. Mm. And, and here's the thing, because of the experience, they actually, the, the victims, they defend bad behavior. Mm. And this is common. I mean, take abusive relationships with people. You know, if a, some, a wife is getting abused right. or something, she'll often defend, you know, the person that's doing the abusing. And there are terms like Stockholm Syndrome where people get captured, they get isolated in a room and they suddenly become enamored with their captor's cause. That's a medical phenomenon that's readily recognized. Gary, you said that we have the answer. We have the answer as Christians. So I guess we have the answer in the Bible. What, what is the answer? What's, we've established this as a real phenomenon, mm. um, happens to many people. What, what's the answer? Well, let me just repeat something too. It's not a case where some people have accused, well, you're a Christian, you're just trying to shoehorn it within your Christian worldview. We've established that the appearances of UFOs themselves seem to be supernatural. We're going to talk about the experience and have done about abductees and it being spiritual uh, in nature. And why are they giving messages to people about Jesus Christ. Mm. Why are they obsessed with him, this supposedly mythical religious figure? Why do aliens travel millions of light years to talk about Jesus? I'm, I'm gonna mention that. But I wanna read out some examples from scripture uh, yep. with some notes here, because I said the Bible's always indicated there's another realm or dimension. The most famous visitor we ever had from that other realm was the Lord Jesus. Yeah. And he stood before Pilate during his trial and he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another place. 
Uh, the nature of angels we've discussed. There are good ones, there are bad ones. People record, the Bible records encounters with them. And the Bible also tells us never to seek after them. There are multiple warnings in scripture, not to seek after the starry host, uh, for example. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the change in the nature of people, how their worldviews are changed to a very, very more definite non-Christian view, like the, the Bible is really just an old kind of fuddy-duddy book. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 24, false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. Who's the elect? Mm -hmm. That's the church he's talking about. So there's a warning to be careful of some of these signs and wonders. Now, I'm not saying that uniquely applies to the UFO phenomenon, but it could be part of that because if you are seeing things that defy naturalistic laws and you don't have a Christian worldview and you come up with ideas of multiverse, etc., then you think that aliens are visiting us and they're our creators. Um, but here's the real kicker, Scott. There's over 400 cases you know, that I'm aware of with collaborators that I work with where these abductions have been halted by people calling on the name of Jesus Christ. Mm. Now, I don't want to diminish people's experiences, but you know, I've had comments, well, you, you wear an aluminum hat or aluminium hat and that can keep them away and you know that type of stuff. No. And in the movie, we have the testimonies of these people who were having these experiences. They were terrified. And in the moment of terror, they re recalled or uh, called out to their childhood memories of who Jesus was. And the instant his name was called, it stopped. Okay? So why do these aliens respond to Jesus? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that indicates the spiritual nature hmm. of what is going on. So the evidence is spiritual. And then when we get to the level of abductions, deceptive messages are being given to people. But then when they're halted in the name of Jesus, that is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And again, when I'm saying that we've now got hundreds of testimonies, and I can't mention names, but I know people in the higher levels of UFO investigations mm. that actually readily acknowledge this, mm. but because of their positions, they can't actually come forward and candidly reveal this. So in some respects, this is one of the best kept secrets. One of the guys, my but colleagues, my collaborators who worked on this, when he found this out, he wasn't a Christian at the time. And he kind of said, well, okay, so what is it about Jesus that these aliens don't like? And he rang up his colleagues in MUFON and said, look, we think we found something. We've got these testimonies of people in the moment of their inductions. They, they said a prayer, they sang a, a, a psalm, a hymn, something, rec something Christian that was spiritual, and the abductions stopped. And you know, so what is it about Jesus that they don't like? And he found out that his colleagues in MUFON already knew about it. Wow. And their simple answer was, okay, so aliens don't like Jesus. Big, big deal. So this is non-Christians in MUFON. Can you just say what, what does MUFON MUFON is Mutual UFO Network. It's yep. the world's largest UFO investigation group here in the US, and they have... Um, collaborators, thousands all over the world investigating UFOs. So non-Christian organization. Yeah. And they already recognize that aliens yeah. respond to the name Jesus. But because they don't possess a Christian worldview, it, it's ignored. And that's mm. why I said, I think we have the answer. The evidence fits what we're seeing. And then the personal testimonies of people mm. calling on, on the name of Christ. Exactly why, as one of them said, and I said earlier, if he's supposedly a mythical religious figure, why do these aliens fear his name? So, so Gary, what um, as Christians, what are these entities? What are the what are these things yeah, that are appearing? Of course, we, we shouldn't assume everyone readily understands. Yeah. Uh, well, we mentioned good angels, bad angels in the Bible. So Satan is a fallen angel. Uh, you know, he can read the end of the good book just like you and I, and he knows what his fate is. And we tend to overcomplicate things. I think sometimes as Christians. He knows what his fate is. He knows who God is. He knows that he's creator, he's, that he is his creator. So the only mechanism he has left to him is to take down as many of those whom God loves with him mm. as he can. Mm. Now, whether it's the UFO phenomenon, false religions, people involved in spiritism and all sorts of other psychic phenomena, they're all ways that he can keep people away from the truth. 
And when you uh, align that also with physical experiences that people have, it becomes very, very powerful. And I found, in fact, Scott, it's very, very difficult to try to minister to these people. We have we have the answer, but sometimes we want to kind of grab them and, and shoehorn it down their throat. I guess just to summarize what you're saying there is these are fallen angels mm -hmm. appearing yep. as aliens. So yep. just, just so we've got that clear. Now we know what they are. We know what the Bible says about them. Can you give some advice, Gary, to people that might be listening who have experienced themselves mm -hmm. or they have other people they know who have experienced. How how do we go about helping these people? Um, and obviously we've got the truth, we can tell mm. them the truth, but um, I believe you've got some insight to share with us. Yeah, on we, we can tell them the truth, but I have to be honest, it's not gonna be readily accepted. Mm. Where I think you can unpick it is in the stories that they're told. There's a massive inconsistency. You know, a person over here says, aliens are our creators and they come from the Pleiades and aliens are our creators and they come from Sirius or Orion. They can't all be telling the truth. And I had a, an experience, in fact, very, very early, early on, just after the book was released, I was on Coast to Coast, originally from Art Bell. In its day, it was the most listened to radio show in America and they, listen, they discuss Bigfoot and all sorts of strange psychic and spiritual weird phenomena. And I, and I confess, this was like my first interview ever I was doing about aliens. And I was interviewed uh, in the early hours of the morning, nationally broadcast across the US. And then we had an hour of talk back. And the first guy came on and he said, Mr. Bates, he said, I've been an experiencer since I was six years of age and this happened to me and that happened to me. And I've thought, you know, he's just loading the machine gun ready to t -t 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 and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. And I say, I'll never forget it because he turned around and he said, and you're right. He said, how come I never saw this before? He said, they don't love me. Mm. He said, they treat me horribly. He said, w w why did I listen to them? Wow. And I tell you, that was, to this day, still one of the most powerful testimonies that just someone being able to bring clarity and saying, just instead of being drawn deeper, just stand back and have a look at what's being done to you. Have a, have a look at what you're being told. Is it consistent? I've kind of developed this little saying uh, that I think there's three things we need to do if we encounter someone who's had these experiences. And we need to listen. We need to listen. And we need to listen. Because if we automatically deny and say, let me tell you what's happening to you, they've had an experience. Mm. You haven't had that. So we need to empathize with them and say, okay, tell me what happens. And, and this has happened to me hundreds of times. Even mm. in churches, people come along, they see the sign that I'm speaking and they'll come up and they've never had closure. Mm. So they are wanting answers as to what happened to them, but you've got to kind of lead them along and let them find out for themselves. So first part is, tell me what happened to you. And then you try to pick within that story, the inconsistencies, you know, in the story that, well, they're really aliens and they, they, they love you and they're benefiting you and they've chosen you, uh, etc. Because once they start to doubt the experience themselves, mm. that's the only time the end can come about. Mm. And then of course, once you have that door open, you can talk to them, well, have you heard about the fact that these experiences are halted in the name of Jesus? Who's Jesus? I've encountered that. Who's Jesus from teenagers? Non-Christian TJ, can you believe that? So you have to explain to them who Jesus is. Well, he's the creator, he's God manifest in the flesh. So if these are really fallen angels that were created by him, he's the only one that can have power over them. He's the only way you're gonna put a stop to these experiences. Wow, it's incredible that you've managed to have these unique um, ministry opportunities. I wanna say ministry, ministering one-on-one -on -one to people through talking about aliens. Never would have thought about it. <laughs> and uh, I, I never would have thought about it either when I started writing that book. I, I ex seen, talked to people, experienced things that, uh, no, no disrespect, but I, some of my colleagues have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you just would have never thought that, okay, I'll talk about aliens and then I'll end up talk, getting a teenager to ask me, who is Jesus? <laughs> yeah. And there's a, a great opportunity. And that, thanks for sharing about the, on the radio, Coast to Coast, that man, and that was the first interview you'd ever done. First ever interview I'd ever done on aliens. Yeah. I wonder if that was meant to be an encouragement for you to keep going down this track, that it's actually a, an area that as Christians, we need to be more aware of and we need people like yourself um, 
doing the research and letting us know, okay, this is the reality of what's going on and this is how you engage with these people. Well, I think it's important because we gave some testimonies in the movie where people had had experiences that they'd gone to the church. Mm. Now, and we're not here to criticise the church, yep. but they sometimes met pastors or Christians who had no idea of what was going on. So they come up with answers, well, you're having a psych psychological or you know episode or something or you're being afflicted by a demon but to the person having the experience it's like no hang on that's that's not right I know what happened to me and so then the next thing they'll go off to one of those UFO research centers of which there's thousands all over the world and they get embraced because they say we've got people just like you come on in welcome yeah. and again they they get driven deeper into the experience so that's why it's so important when we encounter them for the first time just to listen, uh, you know, you, by affirming their experience, you're not ex affirming the deception of what they're told. Well, that's cute. People can have a real experience, but it can also be a deceptive experience. So, Gary, we've talked about how to approach these people and that actually as Christians, we can sympathize with them. We can actually, because we believe the spiritual realm's real mm -hmm. and we believe they're having a real encounter. Whereas someone that's purely naturalistic mindset is not able to have the same empathy that we have. And so we can come in with empathy, but not only that, we do have the answer. And you've had some incredible times of being able to minister to these people and them even seeing the truth. And you've managed to talk to people about Jesus. Now, there might be another set of people watching who are experiencing at the moment, mm. Christian, non-Christian, but they're experiencing. What would, your, what would you say to those people? Um, well, Scott, the first thing I'd say is it grieves me mm. that people are having these experiences and it might be really troubling for them to hear you and I speak and say, well, it's not what you think, mm. that somehow it invalidates it. That's not what I'm saying, uh, you know, because I've met them, etc. cetera. But, but if you are watching and you've had these types of experiences, what I would say to you is if you have been watching all along that we're talking about a spiritual realm, naturalism, evolution can't give an account for the spiritual realm, the Bible, has always said there is a spiritual realm. God himself is a spirit. And when Jesus came, he came to save us from these types and forms of deceptions. And the only reason he can do that is because he is the creator. What tends to happen, folks, is I think, uh, you know, we look up in the night sky and we wonder, I wonder what else is out there. But Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I would like to suggest that when you look up out there, you think about the one who made it all, because only the creator has the power to save us. Amen. Thank you, Gary. That's amazing. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you for doing the research on behalf of the church and behalf of the people that are gonna benefit from this. Um, I just thank you for putting your time. I know you've put blood, sweat, and tears into this. Um, and as you say, if people want to find out more, there's the movie, Alien Intrusion, yep. and the book. Yeah, the book is Alien Intrusion, UFOs and the Evolution Connection, and the movie is Alien Intrusion, Unmasking a Deception. And they're both available from creation.com um, as DVD, as a book, and you can even stream them and ebook also. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Gary. This has been really valuable time, really eye-opening, no matter whether we're an experiencer or we've not heard about this subject before. I think there's a lot for people to learn here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed my interview with Gary, then I've got a follow-up interview for you. In this interview, I asked Gary some of the most asked questions and objections on this topic, but I only give him 60 seconds to answer each question. What's the story with Area 51? What's the deal with crop circles? How does someone stop an alien abduction experience? We reckon this is going to be useful because a lot of people don't want to sit around and listen to a long answer, but you likely have friends and family who you want to give answers to. And so if that's you, click on the link in the video or in the description. We're going to give you access to this resource as well as our email service.